welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous, and I review old school modules and games and talk about trivia and ways to use the modules in your current campaign. This week, I'm taking a look way back to 1977 with the release of the Holmes Basic Dungeons & Dragons box set, specifically at the sample dungeon within the Tower of Xenopus. Now, a few years ago, I did a complete review of the Holmes Basic set, so for that review, please use the card above. Now, this video is actually about the sample dungeon in the back, which has been called the Sample Dungeon Champion of the World. Have I piqued your curiosity yet? Good, let's get started. Spoiler warning, I'm going to go into depth on this one, so if you plan on playing this old school gem, you'll want to stop right here and get your DM. Still with me? Alright, now it might seem strange to do a review on a sample dungeon from a 40 year old Dungeons and Dragons release, but there's quite a bit of lore and legendary to go with this one. So much so, there's actually a blog dedicated to it, Arch Xenopus, and a big shout out to Zach Howard and his excellent blog, without which this video really wouldn't have been possible. The Arch Xenopus blog has a lot more information on this topic, so after watching this video, you might want to run over there and check it out. A link is in the description. Also, I'm not only going to review this classic sample dungeon, but also as I go through the various rooms, I'll give you my take on them and some of the little things I've added over the years. The author of the original basic set, John Eric Holmes, meant this to be a first foray adventure for a novice group of players. It adheres to the best of Dungeons & Dragons tropes, that of a mysterious treasure-filled labyrinth located within easy walking distance of a town that can be used as a base of operations for adventurers. Holmes did a wonderful job with the background here, which I will not read in its entirety, but paraphrase. Port Town, the location of the adventure, is described simply as a small but busy city linking the caravan routes from the south to the merchant ships that dare the pirate-infested waters of the Northern Sea. The dungeon is said to be the rubbled tower of the Archmage Xenopus, who disappeared 50 years prior under mysterious and unexplained circumstances. His tower was suddenly engulfed in green flame. Fleeing servants claimed that the mage had unleashed something horrible within the depths of the tower's cellars, and the mage was never heard from again. Afterwards, things were so bad, with goblin figures dancing on the tower's rooftop and strange sounds emanating from within at all hours, that the town council had a catapult wheeled into town and battered the thing to rubble. The site of the old tower remains abandoned, and of course rumors persist of treasures within the place, but those attempting forays into the twisting corridors below report nothing of interest or fail to return at all. Storytellers are quick to point out that the reported dungeons lie close to the town's graveyard and to the sea. Holmes has the adventurers beginning with the characters seated at the Green Dragon Inn making preparations for the expedition into Xenopus's supposedly abandoned lair. So there you have it. Strange wizard? An abandoned tower? Check. Spooky graveyard nearby? Check. Creepy backstory? Check. Pirates? Oh yeah. Check. All the elements of a great adventurer are in play. So let's move carefully down those rough hewn stone stairs, disappear into darkness, and wander the corridors of Xenopus's buried labyrinth, and see what horrors await us within, shall we? First, let's take a look at the map Holmes provided us with. It's a classic old-school dungeon map, and certainly not the rendition of a hired artist. Anyone with even moderate talent could have rendered it, which is exactly the point. However, there are some great renditions of the map and reimaginings available online if you search for them. For example, Michael Thomas, author of Blue Home from Dreamscape Designs, did a very nice alternate map a few years back, which you can download for free on his website. 
There is a neat redo in the old TSR coloring book, which is available at the Xenopus's archive blog, but I particularly like this one, which is basically the original map just redone in the classic TSR module Blue Ink style by Tim Harton over at Paratime Designs. So for this exploration, I'm going to be referring to Tim's map. In addition, when I ran this adventure a few years ago, I used my Hearst Arts dungeon pieces to render many of the rooms, so I'll be providing pictures of those rooms as well. We begin, of course, with a set of stairs that lead to an intersecting hallway north to south as well as continuing west. The corridors are long, giving the DM plenty of opportunity to introduce wandering monsters and the like. It's also important to set the atmosphere here. Abandoned, dusty, crumbling stonework. That pungent stench of mildew emanates from the wet dungeon walls. Is an apt description here. Add in some creepy sounds, the skittering of rodents, and so on to further accentuate the decrepit nature of the place. Continuing west, we come to a couple of empty rooms. There are quite a few empty rooms in the place, and that makes a lot of sense. But even empty rooms should have some character. Some old bones, perhaps human, might be found among the rubble. Perhaps some rotten furniture and the like is appropriate as well. However, upon entering room A, the party finds that this place is hardly abandoned. A band of goblins is lairing in the place. There are at least three goblins here, but the DM is encouraged to increase the number to give the party a decent challenge. Why they are here is left up to the DM as well. In general, I always had them working for the Thaumaturgist in room F and included goblins as a potential wandering monster in the corridors in this section of the dungeon. The room here is stunningly large, so I always gave it a vaulted ceiling with two rows of pillars to add some tactical options to the encounter. There is a south exit from the room as well as a westward exit. Moving westward, we come to room J. The basic description of the room has lurking 30 feet up in the darkness of the ceiling a giant spider ready to pounce on unwary delvers. Now for me, I'm simply not content with this. Here's my DM style in a nutshell. I pretty much always foreshadow rather obviously what's going to get you and then I get you anyway. In this case, I usually describe some massive webbing in the corners of the room in a small chest sitting enticingly on a stone pedestal along one wall. Obviously, the trap is that there's a giant spider ready to pounce on the characters from above, and so the players usually take the required precautions. For the spider, there's a cubby hole that he can scrunch into to avoid arrow shots. Clever players usually look up and attack the hiding spider with missiles. Most don't want to waste a spell on the thing. They are first level, so it's a quick grab for the chest and a quick exit. Now, the problem is that the small chest is actually a small baby mimic. Nothing too tough, but obviously a character is going to get snatched by the mimic, and it's at this point the hiding spider emerges to further disable the snatch character with webbing as the spider and the mimic work in tandem to secure themselves a juicy meal. Taking the corridor north from room J, we end up in room N. This is one of my favorite rooms. There are a total of ten stone sarcophagi, four of which the lids have been pulled off and ransacked already. The remaining six are left for the characters to explore. To the north is a crumbling wall with a series of small holes in them. At any point, by random die roll, a giant rat could emerge from the small tunnels. Exploring the sarcophagi is done by rolling a d6 and seeing what's there. Of course, there's treasure and magic items to be found here, but also undead skeletons and even a floating dagger will spring forth and attack. Next, across the hall, is room P. This is also part of the catacombs and is said to contain some smashed coffins. Here I like to add that there are side recesses, niches, three deep to a wall with decayed corpses within, 
and there is a gnawing sound as the characters enter. Among the smashed coffins are two ghouls chewing on the bones of the dead. This is a dangerous fight for first-level characters. Hopefully there's an elf among them. Taking the corridor south, we come to room B. Here are cobwebs that conceal wall niches, and nothing can be seen from within. However, if anyone moves into the room, four skeletons will emerge, one from each of the niches, and attack. Moving south, we come to an empty room. Its eastern door leads to room G, or the gloomy room. Dingy, collapsed debris covers the floor, and from this mess will spring two to eight giant rats that will attack immediately. Continuing south from the empty room is room F. Here, an evil thaumaturgist has charmed a fighter from area M. He will command the fighter to attack intruders. There are also three stone statues, victims, of the mage's wand of petrification. Very dangerous encounter here. The evil mage will retreat down through this passage to the west, and if anyone is foolish enough to follow him, he will use his wand on them. In his rush to leave, there is a 50% chance he will drop a scroll of levitation. Following the evil magic user leads to room S, where a spiral staircase can be found, leading up to a trap door in the ceiling. There is also a pet of the magic user here a giant snake that will attack those entering the room. Taking the stairs up leads to the ground floor of the magic user's tower, which is street level to Port Town. Another set of stairs upwards leads to the magic user's lab. Here the magic user has caged a very grumpy ape, and if present he will release the angry thing to attack the party. It's a risky move, as there's a 50% chance the ape will attack the magic user. Going north from room S brings the party to room D. Room D is really the nexus of the dungeon, with four exits, one for each direction. There's a statue here. I always say a demon statue that is pointing to the characters as they enter the room. Regardless of what direction they initially enter the room, the statue will be pointing to them. The doors are especially hardy and enchanted. Brute force will not budge them, and the other three doors appear to be locked. The only way to open the doors is to turn the statue to the door the players wish to open. Traveling westward will bring you to room H. A rather rapidly flowing river runs through it here, and those swept away will find themselves deposited in room K. Cave K leads to another cave, Cave L, where a giant crab lives. While the crab is no match for a party of adventurers, a lone character is in danger, especially one who has had to doff their armor to avoid drowning. Going south, then, brings us to room I. This is really one of the more quirky and interesting rooms of the place. There, a sundial in the middle of the room, and on the west wall set into the stone is a bronze mask the size of a manhole cover. The eyes and mouth are closed. Inscribed below in the common tongue, it says... I'll answer questions, one, no more. I'll not speak till it be four. Using a torch so that the light reflects on the sundial to four o'clock will cause the eyes of the mask to open, and it says, Speak. I'll answer. This magic mask will answer truthfully any question put to it, albeit the question must be brief and pertinent. Afterwards, it will say, I've answered one. Now go away. I'll not speak again today. The fun part for me as a DM on this one is to always try to answer back my questions in rhyme. The reason this mask is here, in this room, in this dungeon, and why it does what it does is not explained, but certainly it is a subject for inquiry. Exiting south from room I leads to a series of caves, the aforementioned K and L, and finally Cave M. This might be considered the climax of the adventure, for here are pirates and smugglers. This is the secret hideaway for their ill-gotten gains. Captive in one of the boats on the shore is Lamunda the Lovely, whom the vile pirates are holding for ransom. She is the daughter of a powerful lord in the city, Surely there will be a reward for her safe return. 
Lamunda is no simple damsel in distress. She is actually a capable second-level fighter, and secretly secured in her girdle is a dagger. Thus, if freed from her bonds, she will join the party against the smugglers, and the characters will have gained a powerful ally. Lingering here too long presents a danger, as allies of the pirates may row into the cave from the sea exit. Also, in the depths of the sea cave is a giant octopus. So, from this very simple setup, the dungeon leads to all sorts of avenues of exploration for the characters and expansion by the DM. They can try and explore the underground catacombs some more, using the eastern exit in room P, or the rat tunnels. Surely, the other two northern passages that appear to dead end lead to something more, perhaps to lower levels where the characters can uncover the ultimate fate of the wizard Xenopus himself. And what about the pirates? Surely allies of those defeated in M will wish to seek revenge on those who freed their ransom prisoner. Perhaps it was an evil rival lord in the city that orchestrated Lamunda's kidnapping to begin with. There is quite a bit to digest and many story threads to pursue from this very simple sample dungeon, which is why it has so many fans. If this video has piqued your interest and you'd like more information, then please let me direct you to the Outstanding Xenopus Archives website. There you can find tons of resources on not only the sample dungeon, but Holmes D&D Basic as well. There you'll find a map of Port Town, a rumors table, and a lot more. Also, on February 29th, I will be at ScrumCon in Silver Spring, Maryland. There I will be playing In Search of the Brazen Head of Xenopus, with the DM being the owner of the Arch Xenopus website himself, Zach Howard. If you happen to be attending, please stop by and say hi. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you had as much fun exploring this legendary sample dungeon with me as I have. Next week, I'll have part two of my City of Brass review, as well as some more old school goodness. Please don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications when I upload more content. Like, comment, and share. Join the RPG Retro Review Facebook group and consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon. As always, my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on.